Hello, everyone, and welcome to our LinkedIn Live today, brought to you by IANA and TTX, the rail car pooling experts. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I'm the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain and Blended, and I will be your moderator for today. Now, you're all here because you are professionals looking to stay ahead of the curve in the industry. And so before we dive in, let me remind you that tickets are now available for the Intermodal Expo, September. September 11th through 13th in Long Beach, California. So join us for three days of networking, education, and innovation, and discover the latest technologies and solutions to enhance your operations and improve your bottom line, and connect with industry leaders and gain insights from experts in the field. Make sure you don't miss out on this opportunity to elevate your business. I'm going to be there as well, so I can't wait to see you. Visit intermodalexpo.com and register now while the early bird rate still applies. Okay, so now back to business. And today we're talking about current market trends in the intermodal industry and everything you need to know as we hurdle quickly towards the second half of 2023, which I can't even believe right now. It's an interesting time for intermodal. Improved capacity, lower cost, less carbon intensive. It should be a very attractive option for companies looking to address consumer demand, fight inflation, and hit challenging sustainability goals. Now, in Q2 2023, what exactly does the landscape of the industry look like? What are the challenges and impacts of differing demand? And how are tumultuous global economics affecting the industry and what more is to come. Well, I am joined by three incredible leaders from TTX to tackle the big questions and shed some light on those key market trends and what they mean for you today. So welcome Trevor Gillen, Director of Economic Planning, Jerry Vest, Director of Market Planning, and Peter Wolf, Director of Market Planning as well. Thank you so much for joining me today. We will be taking questions at the end of the conversation, so make sure to ask them in the comments so that we can get to those. But let's start with some context for the discussion. So Peter, what is intermodal? So I think the, the simple definition is simply using more than one mode of transportation to ship freight, right? That's why we're here today to talk about freight. But if you're a commuter and you take the bus to work and you walk to the bus station, that's an intermodal trip. But in context of the freight industry, we're talking about shipping a container via more than one mode of transportation, which typically refers to ocean vessels, rail, and truck. And I would say that we categorize the TTX intermodal into two broad categories, international intermodal and domestic intermodal. So jumping to the definition of international intermodal, there'd be two ways to ship freight that's produced overseas to a destination, to an inland market in North America. And the first is what we would call IPI, which stands for inland point intact. And that refers to shipping the 20, the 40 and the 45 foot international marine containers via ocean carrier to a U.S. port. Then the container gets put onto a train, moves to an inland terminal, and then from there it's trucked to the final destination. And those containers, the 20s, the 40s, and the 45s, are sometimes referred to as ISO containers or ISOs. That's a reference to the International Organization for Standardization, which, like their name suggests, they set the standards and the dimensions and the specifications for those containers. I'm thank, thank you so much for um, sharing those acronyms. I feel like we have so many acronyms in logistics and supply chain, and it makes such a difference. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Finish your thought. No, I'll try and come up with as many. We, we call the acronyms TLAs, one more acronym, which is um, three-letter acronym, TLA. <laughs> I love that. So you kind of gave us a high-level over, overview of how intermodal works, but how does it really work? I mean, really, at the end of the day, we're buying product, they're getting manufactured, they're being put into a container. Like, run us through that whole chain of events that has to happen for a product to get to somebody's door. Well, the entire supply chain would be, in the case of international, product is made somewhere overseas. Mm -hmm. Asia, Europe, Latin America, pick your continent. Uh, the product is put into the container, it's put on a vessel, 
floated across the ocean, comes to a port in North America, and is unloaded. And there, one of two things can happen. The container can be put onto a rail car and then shipped inland, and that's called the, the IPI, the inland point intact to get to the destination. Also, frequently, it can be put into a 53-foot container, and that's called transloading. And Jerry's going to talk a little bit more about that and explain why that happens. But as to the, you know, how the freight gets going, I think Trevor's going to talk a little about that. But there has to be, you know, some demand, demand for the goods being shipped. And retailers will then place orders with manufacturers overseas for those goods. Uh, usually it's three months in advance, four months in advance, depending on COVID stresses. Uh, it could be maybe eight weeks or 10 weeks out, too, when things are uh, a little less congested in this COVID uh, reduces that stress in the supply chain. Um, so that's really where it starts is people want to have something and it's it's going to be produced. Yeah. And I'm glad you talked about that because when I think of the word intermodal, I really just go to rail, right? But there's so many more components to that. And there's an international component, there's a domestic component. And that's what Jerry's going to jump in and talk to us about now. So Jerry, how does North American produced freight ship intermodally, like when we talk about domestic freight? Yeah, so just like international, I think there's two big options for the domestic freight. So the first is that it could be loaded into a 53-foot container, which you might hear called a domestic container, a domestic box, or into a trailer, and then it will move around in that. The other is, that, as Peter described, some of those ISO or international boxes will move inland. Uh, they might get loaded with a domestic uh, production or produced good and then move domestically um, for consumption as well. And that's commonly referred to as a domestic repositioning move. So those are kind of the two common options. Awesome. So Peter, I think you're going to give us a bit of a recap as to what we've already spoken about so far before we bring, we, uh, we talk about the next part and we go back to Jerry. Right. So I think, you know, to maybe address your question in a little bit more detail about, you know, how intermodal works. I, I think in a broad way, there, there are two types of goods that that are consumed in North America. There are consumer goods and industrial goods. And both of those goods can be made either overseas or in North America. And intermodal overlaying intermodal with those types of goods, the international goods obviously come are produced overseas, come to North America, can stay in that same container intact, move to the destination, or they can be transloaded. And domestically produced goods typically ship in that domestic quote unquote box uh, and ship around the country, or they can also move into that ISO container and get shipped to destination. And that's usually referred to as domestic repositioning move. I will tell you that most of North American goods that are produced generally, if they're going to move intermodal, move into the um, 53 foot container rather than a domestic or rather, rather than the ISO box. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of options, right? For uh, we're talking about importers right now. And I think one of the biggest things when we talk about logistics, when we talk about supply chain, when we talk about intermodal is the fact that supply chain professionals now need options. They need ways to be able to move their freight that really benefits their organization. And we're really seeing that organizations are just not the same right? Their supply chains aren't the same. They have different needs. They have different warehouses. Some have multiple warehouses across the country to be closer to their customers. And so I think the biggest thing that we're really talking about right now is that people do have choice. Exactly. We're all nodding, I think, and on the call. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Jerry, I want to go back and uh, talk about the domestic market. Can you explain to us domestic container and trailer sizes? What are the options? What are the benefits of some of them? You know, what does this mean for supply chain and intermodal professionals? Sure. So the domestic intermodal market does break into those two uh, loading types. You have the containers and the trailers. So about 90% of the loadings uh, using kind of rough numbers in a year go into the containers. Um, so I mentioned that the, um, the, the size of a domestic container is 53 feet, but there are several types of uh, containers. You can kind of bucket them into different groups under that. Um, the big two, the first is the dry box container, which is um, which will load palletized box or even loose freight into. And it's kind of your general purpose uh, container for general freight. 
Um, the other big group out there is the temperature controlled containers. So those are insulated containers that have a heater or a refrigerator on them, mm -hmm. and they're loaded with the freight that's just temperature sensitive. Um, there are some specialty containers out there as well. So some tank containers and some flat racks that are for moving the tanks or for liquid goods, uh, the flat racks for oversized goods. Um, but all of those combine together to be about 90% of the domestic loadings in North America in a year. So then the other 10% are the trailer loadings. So the, the most common trailer uh, that's loaded, it does match to the, the uh, domestic box. It's a 53 foot trailer. But there are smaller trailers out there as well, with the most common being the 28-foot trailer, which is commonly referred to as a pup trailer. And then just for people that are new to intermodal to kind of define a little bit of the difference between um, what a container and a trailer is, what the big differences are, is containers are really just a metal box that freight is loaded into, um, and they don't really have anything attached to them so that you can stack them up on top of each other. Um, at various places along the supply chain. But when it comes time to move them on the road, they need to be put on a piece of equipment that's called a chassis. And a chassis is really just a metal frame that has lights and a hitch and wheels on it. And it allows a tractor to pull that container down the road. A trailer is a lot like a, a container when it's sitting on its chassis, um, only it's one solid piece. You can't separate them out. So a trailer has always had their hitches and wheels and lights and everything on them. There, you know what, sometimes I sit back and I hear of all the names that we've called things in logistics and intramodal and supply chain. I'm like, how did we come up with some of these names? I think you said, a, did you say a puff trailer? A pump trailer. Oh, a yeah. pump. <laughs> I was like, how did we come up with that, really? And then you go into chassis, and I'm like, where did that word come from as well? Well, thank you so much for running us through that. <laughs> but, and I know we've talked mostly about imports, right? Bringing goods into the country. What about exports? Can they use intermodal? And what does that look like? I mean, that's going to look a little bit different, I think, than it would be for uh, importing goods. Yeah, absolutely. Exports do ship in intermodal. Um, so a lot of the marine containers that Peter mentioned that move inland with the imports do move back to ports and then back overseas uh, carrying export commodities. So some of the really common ones are grains and other foodstuffs, uh, plastic resins and pellets, uh, scrap paper, scrap metal. Uh, we see a lot of those moving in the containers uh, back to the ports and then overseas. Um, and a lot of these are bulk commodities, so you do see them also leaving on bulk ships, but containers are a common way for them to export as well. Well, and I know we had a challenge through the pandemic in getting actually empties back overseas to be able to bring more product over to North America. And so exports are a really, really important part of the logistics ecosystem when we talk about imports as well, because we need to get some of those containers back into, um, into the other markets where we need to bring more products over as well. And so I think that's an important part to note. But so while we're talking about definitions and we're diving deeper into how the industry works. Now, Peter, you talked a little bit earlier about transloading. Now, this is a really interesting option for a lot of customers that they may or may not know that they have the option uh, to do within their supply chains or even domestically within their transportation. Can you explain a little bit more about transloading? Sure. And I think this goes to the heart of that flexibility question that you were talking about a, a mm -hmm. few minutes ago. So transloading is simply taking the imports that come in, in this ISO container. So that's the 20, the 40 and 45 foot marine container, and then reloading them into a 53 foot unit, whether it be a trailer or container uh, to ship intermodally to the interior destination. You can transload at any time. You can bring in goods and then immediately transload or you can bring in goods to the port, store them in a warehouse at a port, and then ship them in when uh, you transload at a later date when they're needed. So that's one of the flexibilities that Transload provides. And you know, from an intermodal standpoint, it might reduce the IPI or the intact move, but it, there's an offset that it creates the 53 foot move. And the 53s on a cubic capacity basis, you can ship two 53s instead of three 40s. But a good chunk of the benefit, and Jerry's going to talk about why people do it, is that it allows for the timing and to reorganize where you want to put your inventory as opposed to necessarily shipping two 53s instead of 340s. It gives you a much better inventory play. Um, and trans transloading is, is a well-established practice. It's been going on for 20, 25 years. 
although it's gaining uh, popularity uh, more recently. Um, and it's supported by, by most firms in the supply chain. So the, the ocean carriers like it because they don't have to worry about sending their box inland and finding the load for it to bring back. Right. The trans, transload firms like it because, well, for the obvious reasons, they have business. Um, and the jury's going to talk a little, little bit about why the, the shippers like it too and why the, the um, so what, what benefits it provides to them. Yeah, so shippers um, really like transloading for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the big ones is the, the management of their inventory. Um, so when you place an order against a factory in Asia, it can be six or eight weeks or even longer before that freight is showing up in North America. And just a lot of things can happen in that time. So um, I think maybe an example to use here is it's, it's spring now in North America, um, but it can happen at different times when you're in different geographies in North America. And then the three of us are located in Chicago. So even year to year, spring can happen um, you know, very different times of year. Um, so hey, listen, you know, I'm waiting yeah. for the snowstorm to happen in Toronto, still in, in April. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, so when you place that order, you, you might not really know when all of that is going to happen. So what Transloading can help with is you kind of delay until later in the supply chain when you're deciding where that freight is ultimately going to be sent to which of your warehouses. And it also offers the ability to mix freight. So uh, kind of continuing the spring example, um, you know, uh, someone might be bringing in lawn furniture and grills and grilling utensils right now, and they might get a container of one of each of those goods. But when they want to ship it inland to their various warehouses, they might only want to send a fraction of each of that. So you can right. take that one box of uh, each from a 40 and mix it so 153 has a little bit of each of those products in it for the move inland. So shippers really like this. So going back to the <clears throat> flexibility theme, it really gives them the flexibility to manage where their inventory is moving and it helps them with that transportation and, um, and inventory costs. Yeah, and I think it also, yeah, like you said, it helps with some of the costs, right? I think it's the return on the investment that the shippers are looking for and their organizations are looking for as well. And I think from a time perspective too, I mean, if you think about it, if you have to ship a full 40 foot container across country, <laughs> offload it, and then you've got to start shipping to all sorts of different locations across country. I mean, that's going to take some time and that's going to cut into the time that you're going to be able to deliver those orders to end consumers specifically, or maybe your end customer. So Trevor, it's finally now to bring you into the conversation. You've been sitting there so patiently. Yeah, and, so yeah. And Peter and Jerry, thank you so much for running through the domestic market and what intermodal means. I think it's really important because like I said, I always thought intermodal was just rail and now you have expanded my mindset. So overall across the industry, what are some of the challenges that are happening right now within intermodal from customer business and industry wide perspectives? Because Trevor, you're going to run us through all sorts of amazing insights into, you know, inflation and recession and where we are right now in consumer demand. So let's dive right into that. Yeah, I would say one of the biggest challenges right now is understanding what is occurring in the overall economy and how that might impact future demand for shipping. Uh, you know, given the level of volatility that we're constantly seeing in the economy these days, it definitely makes it a little bit more difficult to predict how things will play out. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about, you know, current intermodal challenges, overall demand is really at the heart of them. And that's either driven by consumer demand for specific products or, or more like derived demand, which is when you need something like auto parts to support auto manufacturing in the U.S. Absolutely. And so we've seen a sharp rise in consumer demand that was driven largely by the pandemic. How has that been inter, uh, impacting intermodal demand? Yeah, so good question. During COVID, uh, consumer demand for services like traveling, uh, eating out at restaurants fell significantly, while demand for consumer goods, whether it was your home office products, electronics, new furniture, while people were, were stuck at home, uh, that rose sharply. And that caused a, a, a pretty significant surge of imports for consumer goods and therefore a surge in uh, intermodal activity as well. Uh, but as life has kind of gradually returned to normal and the worst of the pandemic is finally over, uh, people are starting to resume their spending on services such as going out to eat and going on vacation. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of leading to more of a leveling off in spending on goods, not necessarily a start, sharp decline in spending on goods, but definitely more of a leveling off 
because as of February, uh, inflation adjusted consumer spending on goods still remains at around 17 percent higher than those pre pandemic peaks. So definitely really? not see. Yeah, exactly. That's a, it's, it's a nice uh, data point for that is that the spending on goods is not nearly seeing the drop off uh, in favor of services spending that that people might have anticipated. That's a really interesting point, though, because there's a lot of information out there about how things are cooling down and how a lot of goods aren't moving as much as they were during the pandemic. But you're saying that we're still 17 percent higher than pre-pandemic levels, which is not something that we're hearing just in in general. Yeah, it is really interesting. And it kind of ties into to some of the other content that we're going to go over. But yeah. ultimately, it seems like, you know, despite these higher inflation rates, people continue to spend throughout. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I want to remind the audience that if you're watching this, I want you to join in on the conversation. So if you have any questions or you have any comments, make sure to put those in the comment section so that we can get to them because we are going to get to all your questions uh, once we get to the end of this this discussion. So Trevor, you know, consumer demand really isn't the only big shift that we've seen, right? Global economics have been filling the headlines with talk around inflation, recession, housing, which I just mentioned, right? <laughs> Interest rates. So how is the inflation recovery process going? What does it actually look like? Yeah, so the inflation is, is recovering at a more gradual or maybe a more stubborn pace than most people have inspected. Uh, originally, inflation was able to get so high due to a number of different reasons, whether it was uh, the, the pandemic, the supply chain crisis that ensued afterwards, uh, a really tight labor market, um, demand outpacing supply consistently for a number of quarters. Uh, but put in, in simpler terms, the economy was in overdrive. And right. so what has to happen is the Federal Reserve sets out to cool things down by raising interest rates. And it appears that these higher rates have actually started to help pull inflation down. You know, just recently, the, the Consumer Price Index was released this week, and it actually showed pretty substantial improvements in the, the headline uh, inflation number, um, which came down, you know, that it's always measured in a, from a year over year perspective. So that came down pretty significantly. But then on the flip side, there's also, you know, if you read the fine print of some of these inflation reports, uh, you take a look at something called core inflation, which is inflation ex of all items excluding food and energy. And so those are the more volatile components of inflation. And once you factor those out, uh, that core inflation number was was really stubborn this past month. And so that's been the one that the Federal Reserve really keeps their eye on. And so long as that core inflation number remains at elevated rates, uh, it, it, it's definitely the the core, for lack of a, another word, uh, of this inflation issue, for sure. Well, and I think another really big topic right now that everybody's sort of wondering is high, how high will these interest rates get and when will they start to come down, right? Because that affects so many things, in, including how consumers are spending and what they're spending it on. And maybe they are or they aren't spending. And that always affects supply chain. So talk to us about that. Yeah, definitely. This is definitely one of those hot topics that you see in the news a lot lately. And and really at the core of it is every single month, it almost seems like there's more and more strong economic data that gets released, whether it's, you know, higher than expected consumer spending or, you know, unemployment falls to another 50 some odd year low. And, and though that combination of higher, uh, like stronger economic data combined with higher core inflation, like we just talked about, that's kind of providing the Fed with that green light to be able to continue to raise those interest rates. Again, mm. a stronger than expected economy, as well as that lingering core, that persistent core inflation. And as, as long as that the economy remains hot, and until there's like a meaningful drop in that core inflation metric, I think the Fed's going to continue to raise rates I, albeit at a slower pace, you know, like we saw recently with the quarter uh, percentage point rate uh, rate hike, but uh, not necessarily like the the half a point rate hikes that we saw previously. Things are definitely seem like they're slowing down uh, in terms of those rate hikes. But it kind of sounds weird to say, but it almost seems like the Federal Reserve might need to see a slight uptick in unemployment or a, dec a decline in consumer spending 
before they decide to pause these rate hikes or, or, or you know, hold off on increasing them any further. And we just haven't seen that yet. It's a weird time to be rooting for higher unemployment, but that's yeah. kind of what the Fed is looking for in terms of their timeline for these interest rates. That's like a good and a bad, you know, yeah. case scenario at the moment. And so, you know, what sort of drives that before I get to the the next part about consumer spending, what kind of drives that? Like, you, you don't want to root for that. But then at the same time, you don't want to see the interest rates go up. So what needs to happen right now? Yeah, it's tough. And it really kind of gets back to the root of supply and demand. And, and you know, it's tough whenever my, you know, this data comes out, I kind of cheer with my team like, yay, consumer spending is up. But right. then at the same time, you know, supply levels might not be uh, holding up as, as high as demand. And so whenever you've got that uh, situation, you've got a demand pull inflation scenario. And that's what we've experienced for the last couple of years. That demand has just always outpaced supply throughout this time period, throughout this inflationary period. And, um, you know, with the supply chain crisis, that kind of threw things out of whack with the pandemic as well. Inventories were low. And now we're seeing a little bit of a different story there. But ultimately, uh, demand has always just continued to outpace supply. And, and that's been the root cause for a lot of these inflation issues. Well, and it's interesting because the micro trips, right? We were hearing micro trips, micro trips, yeah. micro trips during the pandemic. And then all this money was being thrown at manufacturing micro trips. And now you're hearing that some of that spending is being pulled back as well. So, you know, like you said, it's like a good and a bad, bad news scenario. So with the overall economic tightening, how is that going to affect consumer spending? Keeping in mind what you said earlier and the fact that we're still 17% higher than pre-pandemic levels. So what does that mean specifically on goods themselves and, you know, how that's going to affect logistics? Yeah. So despite these historically high inflation rates that we've seen over the past year or so, consumers have continued to spend, whether it was on goods at first versus services now, it seems that buyers are willing to kind of eat these higher prices from inflation to maintain their lifestyles. And a lot of that can be attributed to a combination of, you know, the stimulus payments that were sent out during the pandemic, which bolstered household balance mm. sheets. Uh, a, a couple other things like the student loan deferments. People had more money to be able to buy things. Uh, a really strong labor market that continues to, to, to be strong every month and, and, and continued wage growth. You know, wage growth kind of took a dip there for a while, uh, but now is really on a stronger trajectory, which is now starting to kind of meet some of those inflation levels. And so that's a really positive for spending moving forward. Um, but again, now that these higher interest rates uh, are, are starting to creep up every single uh, meeting that the Fed has, we're starting to see some of these rate sensitive markets like housing and automotive. Uh, they're, they're, they're seeing a pretty significant drop off in demand. And so all in all, the tightening financial conditions could ultimately cause businesses to reel in some of their spending a bit. Uh, maybe that leads to reduced hiring and, and maybe even a couple of, you know, we've seen some of the, the maybe more uh, bloated tech companies that have announced a lot of layoffs. You know, they, they might have overhired a little bit at times. And, you know, this could kind of send a potential ripple effect into the consumer market. You know, if, the, if there's reduction in hiring and, and layoffs, then it could reduce people's consumer confidence, mm -hmm. which then could ultimately lead to a decline in spending. Um, specifically from a goods perspective, uh, during slower or tougher economic times, or even, you know, the R word, the, the recession word, uh, consumers will, will usually stick to buying the essentials, which are usually like non-durable goods, you know, groceries, things like that. Uh, and they'll hold off on buying some, you know, more non-durable goods, uh, like a car or furniture or some of those bigger payments. So those will kind of get put on the back burner. So, while you know we navigate through 2023, I think the expectation is that the the spending on non durable goods or essentials is likely to continue, but the potential pullback in maybe spending on some of those bigger purchases uh, when when economic conditions are tighter. It makes sense, right? And so, how will all of that affect the larger economy? Like, what are we looking at as far as you know? We've just talked about goods. Uh, we've talked about consumer spending. You've talked a little bit about how it's going to affect uh, potentially organizations and how the pandemic kind of really led the charge on that for over hiring potentially. And now, you know, consumer spending is a little bit down, but we're still up from pre-pandemic. So what is the effect on the larger economy? 
Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see because consumer spending is 68% of GDP. So it's it's a huge, huge portion of that. And the first quarter of GDP comes out on the 27th. So I'm really, really excited <laughs> to read that report. Uh, <laughs> super excited about that to see what happened there. But, you know, the expectation is, is when things get tighter, you know, and the possibility of, of any sort of change in that consumer spending number, you know, if it's not as strong as it has been in recent quarters, then it's totally possible that since it's 68% of GDP, you know, it, 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 it's a it's a really, really key indicator of, of economic health. So if anything were to happen to that consumer spending number, then it, it's, it's definitely going to be felt throughout the rest of the economy. Mm. Well, before I get to my next question, I want to tell Rob and Alex, uh, Alex is over on my personal LinkedIn, that we are going to get to your questions. Those are really, really good questions. But I want to get through this part of it. And remember, if you have any questions for these guys, this is probably the first and only time you're going to get a chance to be able to ask them your most pressing questions. So make sure to put those in the comments because we want to get to those. All right. So GDP versus freight focused GDP. Now, I haven't heard freight focused GDP before. So talk to me about both yeah. of them and which one we have to pay attention to, how we can pay attention to what it means for us as supply chain professionals. Yeah. So the freight focused GDP, it's a, the name is a work in progress. I'm still workshopping the name with our team. And <laughs> it's kind of a metric that I came up with that it's used pretty commonly in the industry. There are other institutions out there that do a very similar type of, we'll say index. Uh, but basically, with, with GDP, you've got gross domestic product. It's basically measuring the entire economy. Mm -hmm. But in the freight industry, there are ways to kind of get clever with some of this high-level economic data. And, and what we call freight-focused GDP is basically taking that total GDP number and then removing any of the non-freight-related elements. So okay. we would take out something like services or investment in intellectual property, things like that. And this is going to get, give us a better view of how the economy may be impacting freight volumes. You know, it's focusing more on imports. It's focusing more on consumer spending on goods, things like that. So during the pandemic, we obviously saw a massive surge in this freight focused GDP metric, and it was really outpacing total GDP. But like we've talked about, you know, as consumers transitioned out of that focusing on, on those goods spending and then they started traveling and they went on vacation and they started going out to eat and they started to see a pullback in those good spending numbers that kind of had a ripple effect through this freight focused GDP metric you know imports started to come down we weren't importing as many goods uh, and, and we weren't consuming as many goods so in the last couple of quarters we've seen this freight focused GDP metric kind of lag behind total GDP. And so that's been something we've really been keeping an eye on. But, um, you know, that that's something, you know, again, really outpaced total GDP throughout the pandemic. But now, as of the last couple of quarters, we've definitely seen it sort of lag behind uh, that total GDP number. So what do organizations when it comes to freight focused GDP, what do they need to know right now? Uh, I would say so right now, if you do a comparison to the total GDP, it's, it, you know, GDP is measured at a compounded annualized rate. So it's a uh, quarter over quarter annualized rate. So while GDP has continued to grow in the last couple of quarters, we've seen uh, declines in the, the freight focused GDP number in the last couple of quarters. And so that's not saying that that's going to continue into 2023. You know, consumer spending is still strong. There are other elements, you know, while the expectation with imports have been a little bit softer lately, uh, there is the, 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 the declines in that, in that freight-focused GDP have gotten softer each quarter. So if anything, it's starting to kind of, the worst might be over. And if anything, we might be curving back up a little bit uh, with a little bit of momentum going into 2023 from that perspective. Is that a little bit of good news? I love it. <laughs> Thanks for that, Trevor. Yeah, yeah. I, as, you know, I always kind of have to find <laughs> the silver lining for our group here. So, <laughs> Awesome. Well, a lot of the discussions are like, are we going into recession? Are we not going into recession? session based on that information that you just gave us i'm thinking positive positively but what is the status of the recession indicators i think they're what nber am i yeah. saying that right yeah so the national bureau of economic research Thank is kind you. of the institution that decides <laughs> whether or not the u.s is in a recession so they're okay. the 
de facto arbiter of, of, of that information and they, they decide whether we are or not. And so what they do is they track four key indicators, uh, employment, inflation adjusted income, inflation adjusted spending, and then also uh, production or industrial production. And so I have this cool chart where it basically has an index of, of all these different metrics. And if you kind of take a look at that chart, all of these indicators, you know, during 2008 and during the 2020 uh, COVID recession, you can see that these all kind of dropped off a cliff. And so currently, if you take like a current snapshot of the economy, all of these metrics are all kind of hovering at or near record highs. So we're at record high employment, you know, income levels are, are, are coming up to record highs. Industrial production, there's been a little bit of a drop off. They're starting to see a little bit of a weakness there. But again, right hovering around those record highs. And so this is something I keep my eye on pretty frequently, but it doesn't appear, you know, currently as of, uh, you know, the last couple of months that we're in a recession right now. But again, the, the economy is kind of being pulled in different directions. You know, we like we've talked about with the residential market and some of these rate sensitive sectors, you know, they've been kind of on the decline, whereas other elements are, are kind of being pulled more upwards. So the economy is kind of getting pulled in different directions. So we'll kind of see where that goes as we as we move further into 2023. But as of right now, those those core four uh, indicators that the NBER tracks and decides whether or not we're in a recession are all in relatively good shape. And is there anything specifically that we need to watch that could cause a recession from a maybe a freight logistics intermodal supply chain perspective? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, there's a couple of some of these, you know, there's a variety of headwinds for the for the U.S. economy. And, you know, there was the this Warren Buffett interview the other day that he talked about, uh, you know, that we're not maybe not not over with the uh, the bank failures. And, and you know, given the what mm -hmm. we saw with uh, Silicon Valley Bank and a couple others that were running into issues. But, you know, there, there's all sorts of, of those types of, uh, you know, qualitative aspects that can that can maybe trigger a recession. But I, honestly, I think that the combination of these rising interest rates, which are trying to cool the economy down and slow things down a bit, combined with those persistently high core inflation rates that I was talking about, that is kind of starting to show the cracks in the economy. And, you know, that's starting to show the weakness in the residential market. And now that we're kind of, you can kind of see some of these other aspects of the economy, uh, like in the banking sector, like we talked about. But again, I think that combination of higher core inflation and this rapid rise in interest rates is, is represents kind of the possible culprit uh, uh, for a potential recession moving forward. And again, there's also these, this large variety of headwinds that we always are facing, uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, war in Ukraine, you know, things like that, supply chain issues, um, you know, and then there's even some of these, these more granular aspects that people are looking at, like some of the dried up pandemic related savings uh, or expiring loan deferments, you know, as, as people might have to, you know, start back up with their student loan payments and and uh, they, they maybe their savings that they they saved up during the pandemic expire. They may not have as much money to spend on on consumer spending. And since that was sixty eight percent of total GDP, you can kind of tell that if that were to start to to dry up, then ultimately uh, the GDP would start to slow as well. Well, and plus, I mean, on Thoughts and Coffee the other day, I talked about how, how an Antonov airplane has been parked in Toronto airport since February last year. And if we don't have that kind of transportation happening either, that's going to slow down uh, some of our uh, air freight as well. I know it doesn't have to do with intermodal, but it does have to do with supply chain. I wanted to throw mm -hmm. it in there. And now Jerry and Peter have done a really great job of not nodding because they know that I'm going <laughs> to call on them if they nod their head. But now it's time to bring Peter back into that conversation. And Trevor, you did a really great job of, you know, really just allowing us to understand better where we're situated uh, in the larger global economy, in the domestic economy, and also where we need to be thinking and looking um, for organizations, especially in supply chain. And there's a lot still up in the air right now. So I'm going to ask you to keep your crystal balls out for us and hopefully give us some more good news as we move further into 2023. But before we go to audience questions, and remember, get your questions in right now because we don't have a lot of time left. Besides logistics trends, Peter, what else does TTX watch? Uh, 
Well, I think, you know, listening to Trevor, it's, it's what's going on with the economy and then the logistics trends. I think that pretty much covers it. But one of the trends that we didn't touch on is nearshoring or the potential of nearshoring Ooh. and production shifts mm -hmm. from Asia to other parts of the world and how that might affect logistics. So we watched that and then sort of embedded in the, the production shift from China or potentially from China would be, you know, the, the political tensions that Trevor touched on, maybe between the U.S. and China. And so we don't bake that into any of our models, but that's something that, that we watch and you know, keep up, try and keep up with. Well, and nearshoring is really kind of a longer term uh, term play, right? It's not going to happen overnight, but it's definitely like supply chain professionals are really taking a look at their supply chain strategies and what it means for them. Where do they want to move the pieces around? What makes the most sense? Where are they spending their risk dollars? And so that is a really big component, I think, in discussions right now that are happening in the industry. Right. I, I think... When we look at the data, you can see uh, over time a slow migration from China to nearby countries, say Vietnam, South Korea, um, also to another part of the world, I would call it, say, South Asia, to India and Bangladesh. And that does change uh, the trade flows a, a little bit when it moves there. But it's relatively slow. It's To move a factory is one thing, but you also have to remember that there are parts that go into those factories. Yeah. So it's moving all of that not just one specific factory. And, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. And it's been a pretty slow trend. Plus, there's growing production from these countries themselves. So you might think there's maybe a little bit of production shift, but it's hard to see because overall production is increasing, but it's a little bit of a share shift from one country to the, the next. So it definitely takes time. And then could somehow, could it happen suddenly uh, with some geopolitical tensions? And that's really hard to know. Well, and where are those raw materials coming from and where are you now shifting them to and what does that do to your duty rates, right? Your taxes, your duty rates, you know, do you, do you have a free trade agreement with that country? I mean, the, it opens up a whole can of worms of questions that supply chain professionals have to answer and take into account when they're thinking about their strategies. So I appreciate you for sharing that. Now, I'm going to go to a question from Alex over on my personal LinkedIn why might a shipper not want to transload? Not every shipper does. Is it because they just don't know enough about transloading? I mean, we've talked a little bit about it today, but Peter, I think you want to take that one? I think they, they probably know about it. I think there's all kinds of reasons to transload. It's very popular. Maybe as much as 50% of what comes into the, the Southwest ports, which mean LA, Long Beach, that might transload. Now, not all, all that moves rail. So I think a lot of people know about it. So why... Wouldn't you do it? Well, if you're a um, manufacturer or assembly of, of autos, the auto parts that come in from Asia, they're going to go right to the manufacturing or the assembly plant. You don't need to translate those because you're not going to send them to six different places. They're only going to one spot. So that pre-positioning of inventory or trying to help assess where inventory should go, that doesn't come into play when you're going to an assembly plant like that. It also could be a very small shipper that you're bringing in one container every other month. What are you going to transload that with? It's just the one container. Right. So I think there's some good reasons not to do it as opposed to not really knowing about it. Um, but there may be some people who are unaware of it and maybe that, that could grow as a share. So certainly about that. Awesome. So I'm going to go to Rob's question. Do you see an upswing with rail demand when gas prices rise? Is there a correlation? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Peter, Trevor, Jerry? Well, I'll throw out an answer and then let uh, Trevor answer. I, I think I, I'm the old man of the group. Um, so I've worked uh, here at, at T-Tex for 20 years. So I have more gray hair and, and less of it in general. <laughs> and I think over time, we think we've done some modeling work that shows that as uh, the cost change, you know, in, trucking and rail are, are substitutes for each other. And so as the cost of trucking increases, uh, as fuel prices rise, that could push more freight to intermodal. We've seen that have occur in the past. Yeah, it can be used as kind of like a proxy for uh, trucking activity for some of our forecasting and, and things like that. It's definitely something that we monitor uh, in terms of like a direct correlation between rail demand and gas prices. Uh, I'd ha I'd, 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 I haven't really looked into that, but it's definitely uh, a proxy that we use specifically for diesel. Great. 
Thank you. And thanks for the question, Rob. So Natalia says, what country will be the next China? I hear Mexico and other countries in South America. Can you guys answer that one? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get out your crystal ball. We're not going to hold you yeah. to this. This is only yeah. recording and going to be living on YouTube for forever. forever. Well, I think I don't have my population correct, but China's what, <laughs> 1.2, 1.4 billion people. So it's, um, it may be hard to quit China. I, I don't know. You know, there, there are not that many places that have that, that kind of population uh, to handle all the production capacity, but a combination of countries in South America, countries in Central America collectively could take on uh, a lot of the production that may occur in, in China, but that's that's years in the coming. Well, and also another interesting fact, and I know Apple did this uh, strategically, is that they opened up a consumer market within India and then moved some of their manufacturing to be able to uh, facilitate the new consumers that they had of their products. So again, I think it goes to back to supply chain strategy and what exactly works for your brand, your organization, um, and where in the world that could be. Now, I was sent some questions ahead of time. So I also have some questions for you. In 2017, the Panama Canal completed construction on new locks that enable much larger container ships to operate than before. How did that change imports or trade flows? I mean, for me, while during the pandemic, we heard of a lot more containers falling off of vessels and things like that. So I don't know how beneficial the really large vessels are, but I do know that a lot of uh, shipping lines are also putting money into uh, new vessels, obviously from a fuel perspective, but also from a size perspective as well. So who wants to answer that one? Well, I'll, I'll start a little bit and then maybe Jerry and Trevor can, can kick yeah, in. Jerry needs to get back into the conversation anyways. So Jerry, get ready. <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, it's a lot to that question, but it, to, to your point earlier about flexibility, I think it illustrates flexibility that, that uh, containerized shipping has. And you can bring it uh, from anywhere in the world to any coast in, in North America. And then having the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, for that matter, allows that to happen. So just a little bit of history. So prior to 2017, the locks at the Panama Canal could handle a container ship that could carry about 5,000 TEUs. So TEUs... Uh, 20 foot equivalent unit. So two twenties make up one 40 foot. Thank container. you. <laughs> and, and so you got about 5,000 twenties on a, on a ship or 2,500 forties. Um, with the expansion of the canal, you could have a, a vessel bring in maybe 14,000 TEUs mm. through, through the canal. Um, but prior to the canal expanding, you could still bring in those very large ships from Asia to the East coast. They just took a different route. They would go through the Suez canal. So well, we all know what happened there. Just saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the world is round. You can go in a bunch of directions and hopefully the canal doesn't get stuck with the ship turning sideways. Anything uh, can happen in shipping, people. Anything can happen. Sorry. Go ahead. So, Peter. so you can bring it through the, the Suez Canal, and that actually would take two more days than a Panama Canal routing. So with the canal expanding, you can save uh, two days, but it's a 28 to 30 day voyage. So I'm not sure that the canal itself and the expansion changed the trade flows, but it enabled the continuation of the flexibility that we all look for in, in uh, containerized shipping. Great. Thank you, Peter. Jerry, you're up. Yeah, I, I think Peter hit the nail on the head. It's uh, It just really gives a lot of flexibility to shippers, um, and then they can look at their supply chains and pick a strategy that works best for them. Awesome. Now, I have another question over on my personal. Daniel says, why have we seen a shift toward Gulf Coast and East Coast East Coast ports, even with congestion down in LA and Long Beach. Can you answer that? So that that's in part due to uh, perhaps making your um, supply chains a bit more resilient, mm. again, adding to that flexibility. And we're also seeing production shift, again, from North Asia to South Asia, so from China to India and Bangladesh that we were talking about earlier. And the shortest, fastest route from that part of the world to North America is the Eastern Gulf Coast. Hmm, interesting. Taking advantage of that. 
Awesome. Great questions, guys. I've got another one for you. So I saw a 53 foot container that looked like it contained a refrigerator. I know refrigerated trailers exist and operate in intermodal service. Are there refrigerated containers too? Now, this was a question that I was given ahead of time. So I know the answer. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll take this one. So yes, there are um, refrigerated containers out there. Um, so they do fit into that 53 foot domestic container um, general grouping. Uh, and it's a, a, um, a, a fleet that's been growing over the last several years. So a new type of container was developed uh, several years ago that's referred to as a slimline uh, refrigerating mm -hmm. container. And what that's really done is it allowed the, the refrigerator unit on the end to be a little bit more narrow uh, so that you have a little bit more cargo space because the ultimate size of the 53 foot refrigerated container has to be the same as a 53 three foot dry box so that they can be stacked on top of each other. So the, the thinner that that uh, refrigerator unit is, the more cargo space you have. And, and that's led to uh, more of these containers entering the fleet. And I think that provides a couple of benefits. Um, and one of them is um, you have a, access now to the container network as well as the trailer network as a shipper, which might just open up a few more OD pairs and more opportunities for you. So that is a fleet that we have seen that's increasing over time. Yeah, and there's a lot of nuance to it. So if you are going to ship in refrigerated containers, you got to make sure you've got the right partner and you know the temperature. And there's a whole bunch of nuance that I think we could probably talk a whole other hour on. But definitely do your research if you're going to use those. Now, you talked about uh, nearshoring, Peter. So one other question that I was uh, given is that if nearshoring is something that we are going to be seeing more of uh, moving into the future, what impact is that going to have on intermodal? So if there's going to be more production, say, in, in Mexico or North America, then yeah. the odds are that'll move into a 53-foot unit. So we talked about at the top of the hour, right, that mm -hmm. most domestic freight, so freight produced in North America, uses the 53-foot the container. Uh, and then you'd see less freight perhaps coming into the ports themselves, um, less fall off and uh, will fall off in transloading, less of this IPI freight that we were talking about. So depending on where the production shift occurs, uh, you might see a little bit difference in the container sizes that are being um, transported around the country. Amazing. These have been some great questions for the, from the audience. Thank you so much for sending those in. And again, if you have any other questions after we end this broadcast, you can always reach out to Trevor, Jerry, and Peter. I'm just doing, doing this. They don't know I'm doing this, but you can reach out <laughs> to them on LinkedIn. <laughs> right, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So finally, then, what would you like to leave the audience with? Do you have a final thought, question, or maybe even a resource to share to sum up what we've talked about today? Peter? Well, I, I think it just what, what you hit on earlier is just the flexibility of intermodal. And it provides a bunch of different combinations. And, and we don't know what's going to happen in the world, but intermodal can handle it. So if there's this nearshoring, if that continues, it can move in a 53 foot container. If there still stays in overseas production, it can move in an ISO container and you can translate it or ship it directly in intact. So it, it provides, as you said, a, a, a wide variety of flexibility. And then what you also talked about at sort of the top of the hour is that, you know, it, it's less carbon footprint, uh, healthier for the environment, um, speed to market, low cost. So I love it's a lot to, to, to sort of. It's not just one word, not a one word summary, sorry. No, it's all good. And I think that a lot of our audience today has probably been furiously taking notes because you have all provided such really good information to, you know, uh, supply chain professionals, organizations, businesses, and so, so much more. And so intermodal freight shipping is a possibility for just about any shipper with no requirement to have tracks at the origin or destination of your shipment. Intermodal is highly accessible, right? Trucks handle the first and last mile of the shipment and you reap the benefits of using trains to handle the portion in between. Thank you so much to Trevor, Jerry, and Peter for that valuable session. I really enjoyed it and it was packed full of insights for the listeners to take away. A big thank you to everyone who joined us today, whether you are watching or listening. Do go to check out ttx.com for more information on how TTX helps support shippers in a wide range of industries with its rail cars and freight car management tools. And of course, you can visit intermodal.org for all sorts of industry resources, data, education, and events. And speaking of events, 
make sure that you go and get your early bird ticket for Intermodal Expo. That's September 11th through 13th in Long Beach, California. Join industry leaders and innovators from across the supply chain as we explore the latest trends and technologies in intermodal transportation. Discover new partnerships and gain invaluable insights with engaging keynote speakers, interactive exhibits, and networking opportunities. Intermodal Expo is the premier event for anyone involved in the intermodal freight transportation industry. Don't miss out. Come say hi to me because I'm going to be there and register today at intermodalexpo.com. That's it for us today. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to Trevor, Jerry, and Peter. And thank you again to Ayanna. Have a great day, everyone.